Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Socrates uh, back with Tyler Jenks, and we are here on the Hyperwave YouTube channel with Lucid Investments. And today we are going to be um, analyzing the long and short ratio and the uh, big move that we've recently seen in that. We're going to be taking a look at whether or not uh, that data is reliable or if it is something that uh, maybe just needs to be uh, disregarded. And uh, that is in large part due to um, um, starting to look into the um, where the data is coming from, and that is um, mostly from Bitfinex, and then the options that they allow for traders to um, claim or cover their position, and how that may affect the data that is um, provided for the long and short ratio. Um, so before getting into that, uh, say hello to Tyler. How, how are things going today? Things are going great. I'm kind of winding down from uh, the trip at cleaning up a lot of uh, loose ends, talking to a lot of clients, mainly because of all the movement in these markets. Uh, stock market uh, opened up really big. It gave back some of it, but closed uh, recently uh, at uh, with big gains. Some of the indexes at all new time highs, big pullback in gold today. And then, of course, a big pullback in the cryptos as we speak, and we will be taking a close look at that. Um, so uh, very difficult times, but very important times. And this topic about the uh, re relying on data that is coming from exchanges, particularly if it's only one exchange, or a couple of exchanges where you're not real sure what the validity of the data is relative to your, what your expectations are about it is very interesting uh, to me. And uh, uh, so we're going to get into that a little bit just with the understanding that it's uh, getting pretty confusing. And uh, a lot of people in our Telegram group have posted some very interesting thoughts about it. Some concluding that the data is worthless because of what uh, Socrates and I will be talking about in just a minute, having to do with closing positions or settling positions, and why so many people consider it the same as what happens in the options market in the real world, not the options market or the futures market in the uh, crypto world. Um, and that's why there's a lot of confusion about it, I think. So that'll be interesting. We were going to talk about stop and reverse points today because uh, a lot of people were very interested in the discussion that Socrates and uh, Tone and I had yesterday uh, before I uh, accidentally shut the uh, broadcast off. But um, the stop and reverse, we were all amazed at how precise they had been in the crypto market as well as other markets for a very long time. I've experienced that in uh, traditional markets for 40 some odd years now since I learned it from um, Wells Wilder Jr. But then we began uh, wondering about the calculation of it. And we're still trying to resolve that. I need to get some original paperwork that I have from Wells Wilder Jr. But we'll talk about that a little bit later in the show. We're going to start off with this discussion of um, this giant drop that we saw. Those of you that watch Block TV, Joe Saz covered it today. We're going to cover it again tomorrow because it was something like a 60% drop uh, on the last trading day of the day, week, and month. Um, and we're all wondering what the heck happened. So we're going to try to pick it apart a little bit here and see if we can uh, shed a little light on it. One of the things I would encourage everybody to do is just uh, take a look, just Google um, um, information about settlement prices and settlement dates in the traditional markets. 
Uh, we're not going to get too deep into it today, but we are going to. So um, uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Socrates, and we're going to try to break it down, and then we're going to take a look at uh, what the heck is going on with uh, the crypto markets. All right. Um, so yeah, this has been a bit of a learning experience for me. I, as of yesterday or a few days ago, really had, had no idea um, what claiming a position was, and that is what um, Bitfinex uh, seems to refer to settling a position. Um, so settling a position is um, different from closing a position um, in the sense that the underlying asset needs to be um, delivered on the settlement date opposed to um, just closing out the contract. Um, now, as that relates to Bitcoin, um, you can use a Bitcoin to cover or to settle a position um, if you are uh, net short, opposed to just going out to the market and closing that position. Um, so let's say just for example, um, if you had a million dollars worth of shorts on Bitcoin at Bitfinex and you originally borrowed that Bitcoin to open the position. If you're going short, you're going to deposit money into a margin account, which is essentially your collateral. And then that will be used to borrow how much money you want to go ahead and open the short. And um, I said borrow money, really what you're doing is borrowing the asset in this sense, if it's Bitcoin and you're wanting to short Bitcoin and you have US dollars, well, you can put US dollars into your margin account and then use that to borrow Bitcoin and then you would sell that on the open market. Um, so that would be a transaction that is recorded in the open market on, on the order books um, as a sell. That is sell pressure that somebody else then bought. Okay, so that would then affect affect the long short ratio. It would say that now there's a little bit more um, short uh, because this guy just came in and um, he added to the um, short side of the ratio. Um, but when he is ready to close, there is two options on Bitfinex. Um, you can just close it uh, normally in the sense that you would go to the market and enter an order to buy that same amount and then through buying back that Bitcoin that would get returned to the original person that you borrowed it from and then uh, the difference is what you would net if the price did go down um, then you would be up and you would get to keep that difference uh, if the price went up and you got stopped out um, then that loss would come out of your margin account and now you can pay back the person that you borrowed from. And that's uh, traditionally how most people understand uh, margin trading. And that is all recorded on the order books. Whereas Bitfinex offers an option to um, claim the position. And in that sense, what you would do is deposit Bitcoin onto the exchange into your margin wallet and then on um, and then you could settle that position by now paying back that borrowed bitcoin with bitcoin that you already have okay so you've got bitcoin in your wallet and now i'm going to instead of going out to the open market and buying it on the open market i'm going to transfer the my bitcoin that i already have to bitfinex put that into my margin account and then use that to pay back the person that I originally borrowed the Bitcoin from. And when that happens, it's not recorded on the order books. There's no, I'm not going out into the market and buying. This is Bitcoin that I already had. I'm now using that to cover the position um, without it being an order on the open market. So in the sense that um, somebody was short, I believe it was 20,000 Bitcoin. 
and he that went into the market and sold 20,000 Bitcoin that he had borrowed, but he never bought it back. He instead transferred his own 20,000 Bitcoin to pay back what was borrowed. So that um, in the end of the day, the net result is 20,000 Bitcoin sold, but never bought back. Okay. So that would really screw with the long short ratio. And that is essentially just what we saw. So I'm going to go ahead and throw on screen share, try to find the right tab and not having any luck. So screw it. I'm just going to share the whole screen and make sure we got on that. Okay. Um, nope, wanting the long. So taking a look at the action here, this is the long short ratio on Bitfinex. Um, excuse me, this is not the long short ratio. This is just the shorts, just the number of shorts. Um, and we see that it was way up here, um, kind of at resistance, almost looking like the shorts were over leveraged and like the shorts were primed for a squeeze. Um, notice the areas of resistance that I have kind of lined out. Um, but what happened was um, basically the, there was one trader or one group who had accounted for all of that short exposure. And he didn't go on to the market and buy it back, pushing the price up. Instead, he was able to cover the entire position. I think he was short 20,000 Bitcoin. And he covered the entire position without affecting the price at all. And he did that by claiming, claiming the position, by sending Bitcoin to the account and using that instead of going into the market and having to buy back 20,000 Bitcoin. Imagine the slippage that would occur if you had to buy back 20,000 Bitcoin. Um, the price would go up and this would come down. Uh, this The shorts come down and the price goes up. Whereas what happened here, the shorts came down in a huge way in the blink of an eye, but the price didn't go anywhere. And that's because he didn't actually, this person or group, didn't actually go to the market to buy back the Bitcoin. They simply claimed it, which allowed them to exit with zero slippage. And it really, in like in the matter of no time, these are hourly candles. Let's just take it back even to 15 minute candles. I mean, it's probably in the matter of one minute. Um, we're unable to, yeah, basically in the matter, no, nope, we're unable to see it on the minute chart, but essentially in the matter of a blink of an eye, uh, the shorts went from being um, kind of over leveraged to all the way, 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 way down here at support. And this really threw a lot of people for a spin because there wasn't these big market buys occurring um, on Bitfinex that you would expect um, if these massive shorts are being covered. Um, so that is how that person or group of people was able to exit a massive position without affecting the price, but while um, tanking this uh, BTC USD shorts, um, that the short eventually, they, it picked it up, uh, but basically kind of too late. And, and it really, if you were using this metric, um, it, it became almost useless um, throughout this move right here because of the ability for that trader to claim his position opposed to having to actually go out to the market and, and market buy back that Bitcoin. Um, so that is my best explanation for what happened and why we have this massive move down in this long short ratio and um, how basically there's a number of ways that this is benefiting that big money trader, that whale. Um, he was able to keep his position very well disguised, um, which is beneficial for a number of reasons. Um, and then he was also able to exit without any slippage. Um, so the, that's the two reasons why I can um, understand why somebody would want to claim a position opposed to the traditional method of just closing it out. Um, but I'm very curious to hear Tyler's thoughts in terms of 
Um, is this something that you um, have seen in traditional markets? And is it something that is um, very beneficial to, to use for people who are uh, maybe not necessarily big money traders, um, but to um, are interested in maybe minimizing some slippage or, or being um, a little bit sneaky with what their position is. Uh, I, I'm excited to hear your opinion on that. Well, th to me, there's a much bigger issue here. And I know there's a lot of people that are tired of me saying it, but I've basically been uninterested in the crypto market, you know, for almost a year and a half now until we've finally for the first time made a recommendation to buy a little bit of Bitcoin. And my reasoning for that disinterest is I don't trust, haven't trusted and won't trust for a long time, anything to do with what people are telling me about what they are doing in the crypto space, because they don't have to. They can say anything they want. They can do anything they want. They can publish any numbers they want. They can make a uh, hundred million tether appear out of nowhere. They can make it disappear. They can move it to Panama. They can do all kinds of things and regulators aren't involved in it. And because of that, uh, when I look at some of the analysis that's done in the crypto market by even the best analysts, the Willy Woos and the David Pools um, and the um, Murads, where they came up with this great new way of tracking one thing, which was what was going on basically in the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, after a year of using that, they found the data was not good to their liking and they came out with another way of doing it where they believe it is a much better data. And it, I'm sure that it is because they're very uh, meticulous at the type of analysis they do. I don't have a year or a year and a half to try to figure out what a particular exchange or a set of numbers coming from within this ecosystem are all about. Uh, so I just ignore it all. I'm disinterested in it. I don't want to try to figure out what is good data and what is bad data. What is a good exchange? What's a bad exchange? What projects are real and what projects are not real? Somebody else can worry about all that stuff, but my clients are not going to be exposed to any of it through me. Now, the reason I'm ranting on this again is because of what we've just seen with what more and more people were using as information that they thought was valid and they could trade off of. Now, if the same thing was going on in traditional markets, I would have a lot of confidence in looking at uh, the numbers coming off of exchanges the numbers of transactions, the volume numbers, um, all of that sort of thing in both the option market and the futures market, because I've worked in both of those for years and years and years. And guess what? The numbers don't change. And it's the same across all exchanges that are regulated. And it's the same across all brokerage firms that are really responsible for what goes on in terms of shorting and borrowing stock. Okay, what does that mean? It means that in the futures market, everything is done with an exact period of time. Everything closes or settles a month from now, two months from now, three months from now, a week from now on a particular date at a particular time. That's called settlement. And what happens is you as an investor go through not an exchange, but a brokerage firm. You have your money at a brokerage firm that is regulated by the National Association of Security Dealers, the NASD. 
that is overseen by the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Then that broker places an order for you to buy 100 shares of Tesla stock if you want to buy it. They don't sell you the stock. They go to the exchange and they put the order in and the exchange is regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission under the 32 Act, the 33 Act, the 34, 33 Act, 34 Act, and the 1940 Act. Now, who the broker is, who the advisor is that you're talking to, you're not talking to the exchange, you're talking to a broker, a brokerage firm that gives you either the ability to go online and put in a trade to buy 100 Tesla or to pick up the phone and call someone who's a representative of the broker brokerage firm and they will tell you um, that your your order went through went through the exchange process and they actually got you a better price than expected or not quite as good as you expected and you can say I want the time and sales on my order. I want to see exactly when and how that order was placed and at what point I got my fill on it. And that it works perfectly well for everybody. And so you just assume that when you buy Tesla stock, you got a pretty good deal because you know that that brokerage firm is using exchanges that both parties are uh, protected by the regulations of the overseers. Not true anywhere in the crypto world. Therefore, I don't like to play those games. And so I go outside the system and buy stuff like GBTC uh, that falls under that kind of guidance. Okay, I don't want to get too far off track. But I just want to under, you to understand that when the futures market in Bitcoin was approved through, I, through basically the uh, CME and again was approved in some form through the CBOE to trade Bitcoin futures or Bitcoin options, they were all a regulated and exchange. And that's what everybody got excited about until it actually came out and then Bitcoin has basically been falling ever since. So there was all kinds of FOMO because, oh boy, we in the crypto world have made the big times. We don't have to play games with exchanges that may or may not be working in our best interest. We don't have to work through brokerage firms that are also part of the same exchanges that may or may not be trading against us with their money at their brokerage exchange, at their exchange, using their techniques and their rules. Now, a couple of them say that they are uh, completely compliant with regulators. I don't believe that. I can't prove it. I just don't believe it. And I don't want to take the time to figure it out. Hire the lawyers, take a look at all the details, look at all the documents, all the small print. What I've told you as an audience from day one, a year and a half ago is, if you are going to put your money on an exchange, just start out with a little bit of money and do everything you can to test what they allow and disallow and also to try to understand when they change the rules, how long it takes them to tell you they have changed the rules. Now we know what's recently gone, gone on with Tether and with various exchanges about changing the rules midstream and not making it public for days, weeks, or months after the fact until finally somebody blew the whistle on them. I don't want to have to do that with the 200 exchanges around the world that you and I or Socrates and I could have set up overnight, given it a name, allowed certain cryptos to trade on it if they paid me a lot of money as an exchange to allow them to do it. 
and then rewriting the rules midstream on what the client, the investor or the speculator can expect from that new thing. I don't have the time or I could care less. If you guys want to put your hard earned money in these fly by night organizations all over the world in places that nobody can find, is it really in Panama? Is it in the Cayman Islands? Is it in Malta? Is it in Switzerland? Is it a holding company in Switzerland that has a sub in Malta that has a sub in Panama that there is no kind of contract for anywhere along the line? It's handshakes and winks and nods. Go ahead and do it. But I'm not going to play that game. Now, what all of that means in reference to this is I know perfectly well how option trading and futures trading works in the real world, not in the pretend world. And there are two separate things. One is called closing a position and one is settling a position. And the way that works is very simple. You don't need when you sell uh, a gold contract to have any gold to sell. You can simply short it. Now your account is short, but the brokerage firm you're trading it through needs to find that gold and a hundred ounce, let's say a hundred ounces of gold for you to short that contract. And you're going to pay interest on it to the brokerage firm, what's called the broker call rate. So it's a, it's a position the broker, it doesn't want to be on the hook for you shorting gold unless you've got gold to short or to sell. And that's where the difference between closing a position and settling a position begins to form. Settling a position that you have sold. And let's take the earliest example, which is in agriculture. When someone plants corn, and they plant 5,000 bushels of corn, they want to know what they're going to get for that corn when it's ready to harvest. It isn't there yet. It's in the form of a seed planted in the ground. But they can sell or sell that forward contract that doesn't come due until September back in March or April. And they can lock in a price back in March and April for what they are going to deliver to the exchange in the form of 5,000 bushels of corn six months in the future. And they've already been paid for it. Now, what happens from the exchange's point of view, first of all, you've got to qualify that you are actually in the business as a professional farmer and that for the last 20 years, this is what you've done and delivered to the exchange without any problems. They go through that whole process to know who you are, that you can settle on that date. If your crop is wiped out because of weather, then you are on the hook on settlement date to come up with 5,000 bushels of corn that you don't have. And the way you do that is you simply deliver uh, corn that you buy from another party before that settlement date. So on settlement date, you've got it to deliver to the exchange. That's called settling a contract. You folks as speculators may or may not have enough Bitcoin or have never had enough Bitcoin or have no Bitcoin, but you can still short Bitcoin on places like Bitfinex or BitMEX and other places with provisions. Some of the provisions are you have to have Tether or you have to have Bitcoin to deposit on the exchange and then you get tether for it and you can use the tether to go long or to go short and do different things. But that's unique 
to one of the best and the, the most important um, exchanges in the crypto world. All of the other 199 don't do it that way. They've got their own rules. So what I've told everybody is if you're going to park money at Quadriga, and we've got clients that did it, they were in cash, and they lost all their money. Now, try to unwind what actually happened there. It's in the news. The wife did this. The husband did this. Took the money in. Took it out of clients' accounts moved it to another exchange in their own names. He ends up dying. What happened to the money? I don't care. I'm not interested in the story. I've got better things to do to try to unravel the rat's nest that is the crypto market. Okay. But some of you have chosen to play that game. Some of you have been hurt by it. Some of you have found you are on an exchange that closes for a day or two days or five days and promises to get your money back. Not when you need it, not when you want it, not when the market is trading, but when they're good and ready and they've got all their books and games straightened out that, that they can pay you off like Bernie Madoff does. It, but yes, you can make money and let, yes, many of you have, but that's your world. That's not my world. Okay. So what happens in the real world is there's always a counterparty. If you buy something, you're buying it from somebody who is selling it on that exchange. And you are both doing it through a broker who is very carefully watching what everything does. Otherwise, the broker is going to get fined by the regulators. Nobody gets fined in this business, the crypto business. Nobody goes to jail in the crypto business. All they do is they close down shop and go start up another project somewhere. Okay. So that's the right way to think about it. And unfortunately, so many people that know the right way to do it have got sucked into the crypto world. So they assume that all these words like settlement and closing prices and what you do, putting things to a different party are valid. They are in the real world, but they may or may not be in the crypto world. So I've told everybody, if before you move money onto an exchange, see if that exchange acts as a broker and sells to you on their own exchange or they do not. Read all of the documents, the 650 pages of documents in little, little type to try to figure that out. Or better yet, get somebody on the phone that will explain it to you. Good luck if you've tried doing that. I have. When I got started with this six years ago, I went through all the machinations that you're all doing and I finally walked away from it all because I found a way that I could, could buy Bitcoin. I could sell Bitcoin. It's complicated. It has to do with an ETF, but I never have to think about all these things that I'm now telling you that by now you should realize for yourself, <clears throat> you can't trust the volume. You can't trust the long shorts. You can't trust the data of where those, that information is coming from. So now what we're trying to do is try to figure out how in a minute can what everybody thought was the level of long shorts at Bitfinex, all of a sudden something happens. And we've been reading all kinds of explanations for it. And Socrates has got it analyzed as well as I could ever put it together. And that's probably what happened. It's probably that there is a way that at that exchange that people can move very large amounts of money and everybody else thinks that it is a net long or a net short position. I can't prove one way or the other what really goes on at that exchange or that brokerage form or any other one. I'm just telling you that don't be surprised 
when you hear about things like 100 mil, million new tethers have been authorized, and I still don't have the story, uh, but it's all over the wires today. Maybe that's correct. Maybe it's not correct. I don't know. And guess what? I don't care. Um, it, I care for our listeners, but I've been trying for a year and a half to make that point clear. And what the point is, is if you're willing to deal in small amounts of money and get to understand all of the rules before you try to do anything <clears throat> like borrow money uh, to short, find out what they're going to charge you for it and how often that charges change. I've heard horror stories from people that thought they knew what the transaction costs will be, what the interest is going to be charged, and all of a sudden they find something new is happening. And they feel that they screwed up. Not that they're being screwed, but they screwed up because they didn't understand what was going on. <clears throat> the reason you can't understand what's going on, it's a shell game. And it's darn, I've tried on many occasions to play three-card Monty with people on the streets in New York, and I can never find the stupid little P. And, and it's, it's under one of three little buckets, and it's very easy to manipulate that. What we're talking about in the crypto world are thousands and thousands of iterations of games you can play, people you can talk to that assure you that everything is fine. So uh, that's my rant for the day. But the more I think about it, the more irritated I get that the regulators are dragging their feet on shutting this whole stupid thing down. Get to it. Bitcoin, you don't have to worry about. But where you're buying your Bitcoin, you do have to worry about. The games that they let you play without you understanding what you are really doing, you do have to worry about. Getting your money back or your Bitcoin back in a timely fashion, depending on your exchange, you've got to worry about it. You don't have to worry about Bitcoin blowing up. You don't have to worry that Bitcoin fundamentals are solid. But in every other case, you do. So buyer beware. All right. That was an excellent rant. I uh, absolutely love the impassioned speeches that we get every so often from Tyler. He's got uh, decades uh, upon decades of experience, and sometimes it boils up and uh, comes comes right through the top. Uh, so I certainly en enjoyed that and um, really couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, I can speak from firsthand experience about basically everything that he um, has been saying uh, the every every exchange in crypto is trying to screw you over one way or another. Um, it, it's, it's just bottom line. I, I can't tell you um, how many times I've had, uh, like you said, uh, um, I had one uh, exchange liquidate a position overnight because the funding rates just went up like a thousand percent in the blink of an eye enough to liquidate every single position and then go right back to normal uh, about an hour later um, you know I've exchanges go down whenever I need to be getting out of my stop losses or, or really want to be entering a position it always seems to be when the exchanges are going down um, there will be delays on deposits, delays on withdrawals from the reputable U.S. exchanges. Um, and then when you finally find one that is starting to work well for you, um, uh, Coinbase was um, processing wires for me same day every time. And then out of nowhere, they just decide to ban me. Um, nothing I can do about it. Uh, I have to go find somewhere else. Um, so it, it it's countless and countless things. Uh, another exchange where the the spread between the buy and the sell was um, very, very, very misleading. I, I should have done a little better myself, but it was very clearly set up such that um, you would 
could easily just instantly get liquidated based on how big the spread is that would adjust based on uh, what your leverage is at and all these things that are as scammy as they could possibly be. And there's no reason for them not to be there because the regulators aren't putting their foot down. And all they have to do is set up another scammy bucket shop operation with a new fancy logo and another $100,000 into their marketing budget. And they've got another group of people to scam right after everybody found out about their last operation. Nobody knows who was behind it. Um, so they can just go start a brand new one. No, no problem. I mean, um, every, every, single step of the way, just like Tyler always says, there is somebody there trying to figure out how to do a, a three card Monty or uh, trying to figure out how are they going to scalp you for if it's a penny or a dollar or a thousand dollars. They're trying to figure it out um, at every step of the way. That being said, I'm still um, very much in in crypto and uh, very much have money um, in the ecosystem that is subject to these um, uh, this chicanery, and I put up with it because um, it, it, it is a risk reward situation for me. Um, I, I used to play poker for a living, and I was around when the uh, feds took down, shut down all the poker sites and seized the bank accounts. Um, so I've been there where it not only was my entire, like, literally 90 to 95 percent of my net worth was seized overnight, but also my I could make money, plus all of my money was just gone overnight. Nothing I could do about it. So I, I've been there, and I uh, know what can happen and know how important it is to protect myself and be – as responsible as I can in a wild, wild west environment. Um, so a couple uh, tricks that um, I would um, recommend um, in terms of, I, I couldn't agree more that only start out with a very small amount. Um, you need to figure out, anybody that I know that's been trading and actively in this space for the last few years has, has gotten scalped in, in a significant way. And you have to experience that yourself and still Re, um, come to the conclusion that it's worth it um, to, if you have if you have to get hacked um, or, or have an exchange go down uh, every couple of years or something, is is that worth it? So absolutely, start out very small. People they start small and then that small it returns three hundred percent in three months. So they now what was small they now get very mu much more invested so start small and stay small don't don't get too much um invested in, unless you know exactly what you're doing and you're you're withdrawing that bitcoin and putting it on a ledger and you have an exact game plan in terms of stop loss and and profit taking um outside of that um i am only putting enough money on an exchange that I'm comfortable to lose, of course, uh, but I do actively trade. Uh, a lot of people like to say um, that if you lose money on exchange, it's your fault um, because you should be keeping your own private key keys. And if it's not your keys, it's not your crypto, yada, yada, yada. Well, how are you supposed to trade if, if that's the case? If you're trying to trade in crypto, um, then you're likely going to need to have some money on an exchange. And that's just the bottom line. Um, so like uh, for Tyler's clients, um, some people who um, had money on Quadriga, uh, they were sitting in cash. They, they weren't in Bitcoin. If they were in Bitcoin, they just withdraw it and then they'd have it and then it'd be their keys and their crypto. But what if you decide that the price of Bitcoin is going down and you want to be in cash and wait for the trend to turn around? Then what do you do? Do you have a plan? Like, do you just put all your money on one exchange and let it sit for like a year? Um, do you withdraw it? Uh, do you uh, have a, a, a way to do that? Do you have an exchange that's going to send money to your bank account? Um, these are things that you need to think about. Um, and I absolutely um, want to be withdrawing money off the exchanges in bear markets. But if it's just a, a small sort of dip buying situation where I just sold some spot last night and I'm wanting to buy uh, back in. So what am I going to do? Am I going to wire that to my account and then have to depend on that money getting back in there when it's time. Um, no, I'm going to take the risk of leaving some money on an exchange because um, it's only in my mind, I'm only expecting to be a couple days, weeks, maybe a month or maybe two months. Um, so yeah, I'm going to have exposure to, I'm going to have exchange risk. I'm going to have money that is sitting there on an exchange waiting to buy the dip. Um, so the other way that I mitigate that risk is I use multiple exchanges. 
there's no reason why you just have to have one exchange. You need one exchange that's going to wire money to your account and, and get it back on. There's only a couple options, especially if you're in America. So you need an exchange that's going to get money to and fro from your bank account. But outside of that, um, why not have five exchanges? I mean, literally, why not have five exchanges where if you have money that you're waiting to buy the dip, put it on five different exchanges. So now if one, maybe even two go down, um, you're still kind of okay. And even if all five go down, you understand that you're not risking more than you're willing to lose entirely. Um, so that, that is a way that I have um, looked to mitigate some risk and another kind of tip that um, can help uh, to mitigate risk and also potentially get a good price when you're buying the dip is to use multiple exchanges um, and then um, look for the exchanges that tend to dip a little harder than the others. The lower volume exchanges may be a little bit more risky to store money on, but if it's only going to be there for a week, uh, maybe it's something you're comfortable with. And when you really get these sharp spikes down, that's when these lower volume exchanges sometimes will have like a, a, a real you know, uh, sort of capitulation wick where um, some fat finger just really drove the price way down in, in, in a very short amount of time. Um, so if you're the type of person who is leaving money on exchange because you have a limit order waiting to buy, um, you're, you've got your areas of support lined out, you're wanting to buy this dip, um, you're needing to leave money on exchange, maybe you are, maybe you're not, and then you're entering that order so that if it happens, like you saw Tyler was able to buy below 7,000 and it happened in a blink of an eye, it was like a bit stamp flash crash, but he bought it because his orders were there. Um, so if that's the, the strategy that you're employing, then why not use four or five different exchanges and why not use one or two low liquidity exchanges and set those bids like 15% lower than um, where your outlined areas of hor horizontal support are. That's uh, something that I, I do and I think is a, a great option uh, to help to participate in this in market and in this environment without fully exposing yourself to um, too much of that exchange risk. And the, the next thing that I wanted to talk about is the reliability of the data, because I definitely do have a different perspective from Tyler. Um, he, he mentioned that he, he simply doesn't have the time to figure out what data is is reliable and and when certain things change um, to, to go back and, and adjust and, and, and really be, it, I mean, it, it takes a lot of time to, to look through the different sort of data sets that are available. And, and like Tyler said, he just could care less. That, that's not how, that's not important to him and it probably never will be and it doesn't need to be. Um, but for me, one of the very first things that really worked for me to identify short-term price movements was very simply the long short ratio um, as well as the funding rates. Um, so that's something that from very early on has worked for me. Um, so I paid very close attention um, and um, it has worked well enough that it is worth the time to me. Um, it, it's worth the time and the headache um, because if you do get a good data source, um, then you can really have a, a big edge on, on the rest mm -hmm. of the field. Um, that's basically what we've seen with, with David and Murad and, and Willie Wu. Um, so that is something that I ha have thought a lot about, spent a lot of time tracking and um, we'll take the other side of the argument that I do think um, these are very important metrics and, and basically we can start with just kind of the the overall question of or or theory of if most people are short then you expect a short squeeze if most people are long then you expect a long squeeze that's a very basic theory that is pretty hard that, that almost nobody's going to try to to refute um the the where you refute is um is is if the data is accurate if the data is telling you that 70 percent of the people are short um, but in reality only 50 percent of the people are short that is what can be disputed okay so we're disputing whether or not the data is reliable we're not disputing whether or not um, it would be a good metric to follow if the data is reliable um, so if the data is reliable um, then it would be an important thing to track because we do know that the majority usually lose. And if 
the majority are long, then I want to be short. And if the majority are short, I want to be long. Uh, so I'm going to just share a couple quick charts really quickly. All right. Um, so the um, I don't use the I, I use it a little bit differently than most. I don't use the long short ratio. What I do is I use the BTC USD shorts, and then I compare that to the funding rate on Bitmex. Um, so that's what helps me to determine the the overall picture, which is a little bit different. And like I said, uh, maybe a little bit of an edge. I've I've followed these things very closely and um, have tried to figure out what what is working and what isn't. And um, the the slight differences that I use, I think, are what um, allows me to um, use them in with some success. So in the bear market of 2018, we wanted to look for when are people getting over leveraged on the short side? When are there too many shorts? We're in a bear market, so the trend is going down. If we can identify when there are too many shorts, um, then we can potentially identify um, trend exhaustion and when a counter trend move is to be expected. Um, and this is something that I used in real time and, and did use pretty well in 2018. And, and it was all, all public uh, on TradingView um, posting the uh, trades. Um, and so right here is the first one, April 2nd, 2018. We noticed that shorts get over leveraged. And that is defined by basically breaking through this area of horizontal resistance that was established back in 2017. And double check, make sure I'm screen sharing. All right, I am. So we broke through there, and now this is our area uh, that determines um, this uh, 34,400 area. Above that tells us that, that there are too many shorts and that the shorts are getting over leveraged. I would confirm that with the funding rates, um, so keep that in mind. Um, but right here, we notice that it served as an excellent buy signal. And um, what could have been um really what was really interesting about this is that we're testing horizontal support so we're at support and everybody's short that's huge to me um, that tells me this is what i want to see is that after a big move that these guys get over leveraged because um when would you expect shorts to get over leveraged is when the price is going down and everybody is now convinced that it's got to keep going down um, so that's what I look for is a, is a trend and then these getting over leverage. Uh, so right here, we had our trend, um, but the shorts didn't really get over leveraged. Um, so we didn't necessarily get a signal here, um, which was unfortunate because it did get a good bounce right here. Um, and again, these are things that Tyler is completely uninterested in. Uh, he is not interested at all in playing these counter trend bounces um, nor is he interested in covering shorts here because he's not shorting Bitcoin, nor is he trading against the trend. He's trading long uh, on the weekly chart and he's going long on Bitcoin. Uh, me, uh, I'm a swing trader. I want to be able to capitalize on these counter trend moves if they're significant. Like this was very significant from 7,000 up to close to 10, um, you know, almost a 30% move in about a month. That's absolutely a swing that I want to be trying to capitalize on. Tyler could care less. So right here on August 13th, we get another uh, sort of big, it wasn't like a prolonged, but it, notice how sharp it was. This big move from 84 down to six, it happened in two weeks. That's scary, you know, that's a sharp move. And what happens? We hit support and shorts get over leveraged. Very strong signal. Um, and then right here again, so here I'm, I'm buying and I'm buying, um, and then I'm looking at a stop loss right below support. Um, and here we didn't get a bounce, but we do notice that we did kind of consolidate that the price couldn't keep moving down with shorts over leverage while prices at support. Um, I said, can't, I mean, it's, it would be very, very hard for it to do it. Prices at support and shorts are over leveraged. The only way that I would expect shorts to the, the support to break down is if shorts are no longer over leveraged, which is what happened. Um, so uh, this is, um, and then it also, um, 
basically called the bottom uh, right here on December 3rd. All right, up in here. Uh, that was basically the bottom a, a week before the exact bottom. Um, and that is where we then again return to big move down, scary from 63 down to 35 in a couple weeks. Everybody's scared. Price is moving down hard. Everybody thinks the price is going to keep moving down. Shorts get over leveraged. Price doesn't keep moving down. Uh, it finds support. Um, so to me, it's not very disputable. Uh, the, this data has been very accurate for me. So it, you can go ahead and dispute where it's coming from. And uh, there's a lot of good reasons why you would want to do that. Um, but this is something that I've been tracking um, for a long time and that has worked very, very well. The other side of the picture was true in the bull market. When you went on these huge runs, you'd want to look for longs to get over leveraged, right? Uh, so that is kind of what we could be looking at now. So um, this, is, this data has been very reliable for me and it is a key metric. If we can say that this data is reliable, then it can be very important uh, because it can help us to determine when one side of the trade is getting too crowded. And that is like one of the single most important indicators for me in terms of short-term price movement. This doesn't do anything for long-term price movement. It just tells you in the short term, this support's gonna have a very hard time breaking down because shorts are over leveraged. That's short term. A couple weeks later, that can change. Um, but in terms of short-term price movements, if I'm betting against this, um, that is a big problem. Uh, like if I am short, and I notice that everybody is short, I'm getting the hell out of there. Uh, I don't want to be betting with everybody else. Um, so this is A, A indicator, and B, I find the data to be reliable. Um, like I said, I do confirm with what is actually even a little bit more important to me, and that is the funding rates on um, BitMEX. And um, that has been the main indicator to me that um, A, we were going to continue when we were at six and 7,000. I thought we were going to continue up um, because of the funding rates. And then lately, why I have been getting worried um, that I didn't think we could continue up much more is uh, because of these funding rates. Specifically, let's take a look at June 27th. Notice how, so what we really want to see is around 0 0.01. Anywhere from 0 0.01 to 0.05%, that's reasonable and doesn't really tell you anything. It tells you that it's, it's there, there's not too much on, on one side of the trade or the other. Once it starts to get over 0 0.05, it's starting to tell you, okay, now rates are getting more expensive than they are historically. Therefore, it tells you that the only way that could happen is if most people, more than a normal amount of people are starting to take the same side of the trade. So that's um, happening at, at anything above really 0 0.05. Take a look at June 27th. Um, we, it got all the way up to 0 0.3. Um, that is huge. And what happened with the price? June 27th, so that was right at the top, okay? Um, so the funding rates, when they get to an extreme level, can be another very strong indicator that can help to confirm this BTC USD shorts chart. And what's really good is it's two different data sources. One is coming from Bitfinex and another is from BitMEX. And if both are telling you the same picture, um, then it's something that I am inclined to, more inclined to trust. Um, so notice 27th, that was the top. Um, that was when after a big move, we're going up, we're going up hard. Everybody's starting to call for the moon and, and starting to FOMO if they're not fully entered. So everybody starts to go long and then what happens? Bam. Uh, okay, so that is how the funding rate indicator can be used. Um, it can be used on 
um, Bitcoin and Ethereum and has been one of the main reasons why I believe Ethereum has been lagging um, is look at these funding rates. It's just been insanely expensive to be long ETH on BitMEX um, for a very long time. And that's a, a real big problem. Everybody's long and the price is lagging and, and really struggling. Uh, that is painting a pretty clear picture to me. Um, so let's see here. One other thing I wanted to show is a post that I made on TradingView. Um, so this is the, the post is titled BitMEX Funding Rate Indicator. This doesn't use the long short chart. This is just the funding rates. And like I said, that is probably more important to me um, because um, it is it works better just by itself basically. Um, and essentially, if you look at this, uh, this is an indicator on TradingView, uh, BitMEX funding rates, and you can draw resistance um, at 0 0.07. And anytime it goes above that, it's a sell signal right here, uh, caught the top, uh, you know, perfectly. Um, and then the uh, buy signal is when it falls below 0 0.08. And we notice that that just catches bottom after bottom after bottom after bottom after bottom bottom bottom. Uh, so this is a very powerful indicator. And then not only did it catch the bottom, it told you to stay bullish at 6,062. Everybody's calling this resistance. I was. I was certain that this was going to be huge resistance. And the only reason that I could stay bullish, I didn't buy this, unfortunately. I couldn't take the signal because I was so sure of this resistance, but it just shows you how powerful of an indicator this can be that not only after a big sell-off, um, when it becomes very expensive to be short and um, longs get paid a lot to be long, um, it also shows that uh, continuation is to be expected because everybody's viewing this as resistance and everybody's thinking the price is going to stop here and therefore longs were getting paid a lot to be long at 62.50 and that gave us a buy signal um, at about 55 and 62.50. So caught the bottom and then told you to add um, or stay bullish um, at the 55 to 6200 area. So like I said, this is an indicator that has been very important to me, has been uh, very um, reliable. Um, the uh, I, I always hear people talk about how the data cannot be trusted, but I've been following it every day for years and find it to be quite um, reliable, uh, enough so that I can base trades off of it. Um, so the conclusion of uh, my, uh, I guess, little rant there is that, um, yes, uh, everywhere is trying to screw you. And because I believe that like Bitfinex should be figuring out a way to screw me with that long short ratio. BitMEX can't really um, manipulate that as much because it's based on the free market. It's based on who's long right now and who's short and therefore who needs to be paying who to make this trade work essentially. Um, so that's why I really do trust BitMEX funding rates because that's based on actual what I'm paying. If I am long right now, I can verify that data by going and opening along and seeing that yes, I'm paying exactly what they're telling me. So for me, that data is pretty much indisputable and is very reliable as shown by that um, indicator that I um, recently went over. Um, but also, the it, it makes sense to me that Bitfinex would be trying to screw me over with that long short ratio, but the fact that it's worked so well tells me that maybe they don't care to, or maybe, you know, haven't figured out whatever. Um, as long as it continues to work, I'm going to continue um, to use it. And um, one last thing, I, I quit sharing my screen too quick. This won't take very long. Um, but now that I have started to understand the uh, claiming a position on Bitfinex and how that can affect that long short ratio so quickly, um, I think now I'm going to be tracking the long short ratio on BitMEX because BitMEX does not have that function. They don't have a USD wallet um, and they don't allow for um, settling or claiming positions. So therefore the long short ratio shouldn't 
um, have that same impact. So this is another area where being very precise with the data that you're using can be what sets you apart and allows you to use some of this data um, profitably, whereas everybody else thinks it's worthless. Uh, so this is blockchainwhispers.com. Uh, you go to tools, uh, blockchainwhispers.com, BitMEX position calculator, and um, it gives us 66% long, 33% short. Um, that, that seems uh, fairly reasonable. It also gives us some data for Ethereum. This does seem off since um, Ethereum, the longs are paying so much. I would expect this to be like 70%. Uh, so again, you have to take it with a grain of salt, um, but this is data that I find very helpful and that I will continue tracking on a daily basis and also using to uh, make um, specific um, entries and exits on, on certain occasions when the rates um, or the long short ratios get to extremes. Uh, so that is what I've got. Um, yeah, that's, and, uh, some very good points and backed up uh, at least at the BitMEX level, from Ugly Old Goat. He's a big proponent in what they do, how they do it, and has used BitMEX uh, for a very long time, very successfully. So uh, I think now what we will do, uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, on the show last night, uh, Socrates and I, started looking into stop and reverse points and uh, Tone joined us and said he's never really used them very much. So we, we spent a lot of time looking through examples and um, there's some interesting questions that are beginning to pop up that Socrates and I are going to try to answer. Basically, uh, what is the difference between platforms such as TradingView or StockCharts.com or um, uh, many, many other places, including Bloomberg, that use all of these technical tools, but sometimes they change things about them a little bit. And uh, Socrates asked me, how did Wells Wilder early on set this up where you could do the calculations by yourself, which I used to do all the time because we didn't have all these tools. And I have not been able to uh, recall exactly what the algorithms were. You can find them uh, in general across a bunch of different sources today, and they all look fairly similar. But we're trying to answer the question of um, exactly how and when uh, the next stop and reverse point is placed. And is there a way that we can do the calculations ourselves? We'll have an answer for you tomorrow on that. And uh, uh, that'll be part of what we talk about tomorrow. Uh, just two other quick things um, before we look at Bitcoin, uh, which is beginning to pop here from below the 10,000 level to uh, back up to 10.5 in a very short period while we've been talking. So it'll be interesting to take a look at uh, those charts. But we're going to be doing two webinars. The first one's gonna be on retirement accounts uh, in a lot more depth than we did in our vlogs. We've had a lot of people ask about it, not just the accounts themselves, but the advantages, the disadvantages, uh, the ta tax implications, the benefits to fully funding them across the full spectrum. Um, and uh, we've got a lot of questions from people, probably more than any other thing. Uh, I have found out recently that there is actually a way that you can buy Bitcoin in a retirement account, and we will go into that. But it's taken me about six months to research it because a couple of our clients claim to do it. And I said, be very careful because I don't believe that's legal. And uh, it turns out there is a way of doing it. It's very complicated, but we're going to talk about that. But the big thing about retirement accounts is that uh, it's difficult to get that money and therefore do other things or do silly things with it. And silly things like buying uh, altcoins 
that are going to zero. You can't do that in retirement accounts. Um, and that's just dumb luck on the part of the Department of Labor and the IRS and others that agreed on what the rules are going to be. They, they didn't foresee this uh, wave of uh, uh, nonsense taking over over the last 10 years. And so they haven't been able to react quickly to it. But there is a way to do it. And we'll be talking about that. It's going to, they're both going to be on Fridays. The first one's going to be on uh, July the 12th. And then two weeks later, approximately on July the 25th. On July the 25th, we're going to go into Consensio in great detail, more so than we did in our original, from the point of view of um, what do we use in terms of other technical tools along with Consensio to draw conclusions. Uh, and it's perfect with Socrates on board now because he uses other moving averages that I do. Uh, and he does like the exponential moving averages. So we're going to go through all of the tools available to put uh, meat on the bones of Consensio with uh, a number of different perspectives across a, a very wide range of techniques that can be used for actual decision making. So that's going to be on uh, July 12th and July 25th. I'm going to sit down with Leah tonight and we'll write up descriptions of those. But we just wanted to give everybody a heads up on that. And uh, those descriptions will be posted on the website uh, starting um, uh, tomorrow um, for both of those. Certainly the first one right away, we might uh, take a little more time putting the uh, Consensio one uh, up. And with that, uh, why don't we go right to the uh, Bitcoin charts and uh, take a look at what happened last night since uh, our vlog and what is going on right now. So I'll turn it back over to Socrates. All right. <clears throat> Just had a weird urge. Uh almost click the stop broadcast instead of share screen it, it can be a button's just staring at you i, I understand how you can uh, how you can push that <laughs> every every so often um okay so let's see what we got going on uh, i guess this would be our best bet um so uh, been very interesting price action lately, and uh, a lot to learn. I think um, definitely, uh, this has been a very delicate uh, situation that I'm uh, fairly pleased with how, how it turned out. And um, we'll just kind of walk through my thought processes. Um, so, originally, um, on this sort of move down, I was uh, saying to watch out for kind of a A, B, C correction um, off of the 50 EMA on the four-hour chart. And just to toot my horn a little bit, that was kind of the uh, projection that I made um, a couple days ago as price was um, pulling back off that big uh, daily red candle. Um, I was i um, looking for a bump up to 12,400 based on the falling wedge on the 15 minute chart right here. And then um, was expecting that to be the B of the ABC correction and then the C would be down at horizontal support. And the C was measured with taking the distance of A and then putting that at the top of the B where I expected it to occur at 12,400. Uh, ends up that that is where we topped. So that uh, target worked out very nicely from the 15 minute chart. And then uh, see that this is where I would have been looking for the B to, occur, uh, excuse me, the C wave to occur down into this area of horizontal support, which I've been very interested in buying over the last uh, couple weeks or so. And I called it very nicely, but I didn't trade it um, as 
nicely as I could have. Um, I was really looking at it, like I was saying, don't sell the A, either sell the B or sell the horizontal breakdown of A. Um, so that that's how I like to exit. Uh, so I'm never trying to get all the way up here at the exact top, uh, waiting for a lower high, basically. And if I can get out on this lower high B wave, then that's kind of, I give myself an A plus. And if I get out here, then I'm still giving myself like an A because I stuck to the game plan. And often it can be tricky getting out on this because things um, start to flip. And that's exactly what happened. Um, so I didn't sell anything up here. Um, which is really what matters, you know, posting a chart, making a call that the price is going to go from here up to here, then down to here. That's worthless. It doesn't, there's no money in my pocket. Sure. I, I got a couple extra followers and uh, maybe gained a little credit, but that doesn't really matter at the end of the day, you know, money in my pocket is what matters. So um, making a good call, but not um, getting the A plus exit um, is, you know, basically the, the, the exit is what is relevant. The call is not. So, what I was looking at here is this was very important to me. This action right here. I'm going to try to highlight it. We have been going long today, but uh, there's plenty to talk about. Tyler's back in town. And uh, so, so there you have it. So this to me was very, very important um, because, and this is why I wait um, for the horizontal of the A wave to break down is because often what will happen is either a higher low and then uh, another higher high and then you take off um, or a kind of double bottom, uh, like a, a double bottom big W situation. Uh, so that's why I don't want to be selling here um, because there's a lot that can happen. And right here, it looked like that was happening. We wicked off of the 50 uh, EMA, quickly got back above it. Um, and this, to me, that's a higher low. Um, it's even a Bill Williams fractal, which if there's ever qu any question in my mind, is that a higher low, I'll throw on the Bill Williams fractal, and that is confirmation. That's a higher low. Um, so we've got a higher low, which is not what I'd expect in an ABC correction. You'd expect this to be a lower low and continue on down to the target down in here. Um, so not only did we get a higher low, which is extremely important to me, we wicked off the 50 EMA, responded back above the nine. And right here, all of the um, EMAs were turning bullish on every time frame. Did a show right around in here. And that's when I was just kind of pulling my hair out a little bit, like saying, I just don't really know what to expect. I guess the show was actually right in here um, where I was saying that I really expect this thing to turn around. But... Um, we're getting everything turning bullish. The 15 minutes um, down to the, the 30 minute, like everything right in here, we see it's turning back bullish. Um, we've got the higher low, the price is refusing to sustain a death cross. Um, it's getting back above. Uh, this was just very, very bullish to me. And um, that was why I decided basically the conclusion um, was that instead of taking these buy signals, which are occurring right in here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hold on to my spot. Um, and that made me feel good, um, just made me feel comfortable that, okay, I'll just continue holding on to the spot. I know where my exit is. If this doesn't continue rallying, and if it does, then I still got a ton of exposure and I'm going to be very happy camper. So that, that was my game plan. And then right here, this candle right here was just very important to me and was a terrible fake out um, actually did end up taking a small, very small position on that candle there, uh, leverage position that I'm really fine with because the risk reward was tremendous. Um, so we got this higher low back above. You notice we were resisting this nine EMA getting these wicks and then finally price boom. Um, I think that was, yep, that was right when a daily close. So this was during a daily close um, and this four hour broke back above all this horizontal resistance, smashed through this wick here and all these closes and opens. And really to me, he looked like ready to take off. Um, so right 
we had a kind of a trend line. So we're um, watching it fall towards this trend line and then boom, close above um, this resistance back above 12,000. Um, this looks absolutely prime to me to make this next leg up to 13,000 uh, to make that next higher high. Absolutely prime. This was a, a really sweet setup that turned out to be the worst possible time to buy. That's what's going to happen. You, you got to be comfortable buying, you know, the worst time and, and selling at the worst time as long as you are following your, your trading system and, you know, not necessarily acting out of emotion. Um, so right here, I longed and the stop loss was just at the bottom of this candle. Um, when you get a big, nice bodied candle that breaks through horizontal um, and uh, breaks through the EMA and, and find support from the trend, uh, really there you can just use the bottom of that candle as a stop, um, which is what I did at about 11.840. Um, entry was about 12.100 um, or so. Um, so, uh, the risk reward was tremendous. Um, we're looking at almost 10 to one risk reward, something like seven and a half risk reward, just targeting the local high, which was a very conservative target, might I add. Um, so this candle really screwed, uh, uh, well, just, just kind of uh, definitely screwed with how I was looking at things. I, I was thinking if this candle was here, then I'm maybe going to front run and be fully out. Since it's here, like this was just my crucial spot and getting a nice candle breaking through resistance really made me confident in continuation to the upside. Um, so that leverage position was exited right here at, at a small loss, no big deal. Was still in my um, spot positions. Uh, and then last night set a stop loss. Um, basically we were looking at everything in here that I was really intrigued at this pullback. Everything was looking real ugly, but this pullback was still above here. Um, and I was intrigued by that. So I was holding and I put my stop loss right here about 10, five, eight, five, um, for like 40% or so of my spot position. Um, so covered that there and uh, the entry was um, down around seven to 8,000. Uh, so by covering 40% up in here, that makes my new cost basis um, below $4,000. It gives me a really good cost basis for what I'm gonna be continuing to hold. I don't wanna really be getting fully out, um, especially when it's a, a long-term bull market. Um, I, I just want to be taking profits such that it improves my cost basis um, so that I can then use that money to buy the dip. And if the dip doesn't happen, so be it. I've still got plenty of exposure and uh, a good cost basis. And that also allows me to not use a stop loss with the remainder of my spot uh, because we're so far above where my break even point would be. I don't need to worry about it. And I can just focus on buying the dip and I don't have to worry about selling the rest of my spot now that I've got it down to a, a good cost basis. And that's always my goal is, is decreasing the cost basis. I really want to get it to where it's a negative cost basis. Um, and then and then you're made in the shade. Uh, so that's what I'm always focused on. And that is where I exited was on this candle um, that was stop loss. It was on the books taken out. I didn't have to be at my computer. And uh, now I am um, basically feeling good about what I have remaining. And without uh, rambling on anymore, um, what, what are you seeing here, Tyler? <laughs> Well, taking a little longer uh, viewpoint, I'll just pull up uh, my tried and true, uh, which is this chart that I uh, basically have – let's see. Okay, let me do that. Bring this one up. I've been having trouble with trading view as has uh, tone in earlier today. Couldn't Don't get it. Big boom. Yeah. Boom. Boom data. <laughs> um, okay. So this is my, uh, this is a four hour chart. Let me, let me go back. This is the same chart that I keep using over and over again. I am uh, making some little changes to it, but not very many. And this to me is the big picture. And the big picture, as you all know, is this was the bull market. This is the bear market. And we're in an intermediate term up move. Although 
Uh, remember, these green lines have been drawn from a year ago at the 10,100 and 11,100 level. And this to me is very important that we blew right through them the way we did at 6,000. <clears throat> but in this case, these green lines at a, this zone between 10,100 and 11,100, I believe still is a very powerful, maybe the most powerful resistance area on this entire chart with the 6,000 being number two. And um, the only reason we bought in after running up to 8,200 down between 6,800 and 6,200 is because I respect this very long period of support that then was supposed to become resistance and did not. But then when we dropped from 8,200 all the way back down to 6,200, we were able to buy uh, above that old support. So the question to me now, this is the weekly chart, and I'll just go back for a second uh, to show this six candle after going all the way up to 8,200, dropped all the way back to 6,200, but then the body took off by the end of the week, just leaving the wick down in that lower area of 6,000 to 7,200. I think that's very significant. On the flip side, what we're looking at here is an attempt and a success of blowing through both of those green lines and spending a tremendous amount of time all the way, almost $3,000 above what I thought was resistance until Sunday night and going into Sunday as we got weaker and weaker. And then not only turning the candle red, but closing below both of those lines. So, Yesterday and today uh, were the first printing of the next candle. Now, we're still on green numbers, and uh, Tone was very clear that the sequential, no matter how you look at it, is bullish. And the longer you go out, like the monthly and the weekly, it's very, art, it's very difficult to argue anything, but we're going a lot higher. But... This to me is very important. It's not to almost anyone else, but it is to me. Now, what does that all mean? Well, when we get down to the daily basis and then look at the four hour, I see this entire consolidation going all the way back uh, one, two, I'll even say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten days now. What we've been doing is something that we did all the way back coming down the other way where we came down to these two lines. I should really extend this one to be fair. I'll just put it close. You can see what I'm talking about. But When we first came down to those lines, the only way of knowing that anything might start happening on a daily basis anyway, was after this tremendous run up, uh, we had one, two, three, four candles that kind of stutter stepped around this top green line. And then when it broke, it went, from basically 11,500 in a day and a half up to 16,400. So 
there were other things at play, obviously, before that. But to me, I'm always looking for that kind of action. And then we come back down, but we don't make it down to the line on these two. And then we go all the way up to the ultimate high. And then on the big, big break, which was really over a one, two, three, four, five, six day period, that doesn't show up on the weekly. All everybody remembers is that on the weekly off of that top, that um, we just had a huge candle up, then we, that's all the way back there. We had the huge candle up. Then the huge candle down, which I considered, believe it or not, a break of the phase four. And this is the five. And it all occurred in that week. And it took us all the way down to 11,160 off of 19,000 in one week. And then I consider this the six. Now, Tone uh, mentioned again today, and I guess it was today, that he's been thinking this is all the five. And then the six uh, came over this period of time and faked a lot of people out when it broke back to 11,000 and 12,000. What I'm saying is that both on a weekly and a daily basis, this range between 10,000 and 11,000, I find to be very important. And so far, I believe that it's proving to be just that. Now, Let me just do one other thing and trace these guys back on a daily basis again to show that after all the nonsense after the top and wicking down through that and not making it down to the second green line and then trying to get going again and then coming down close and you notice the stop and reverse on the daily basis are getting knocked around a little bit that uh, then when we finally come down to it and break through it on a daily basis, both the green lines, we close above it on the first one, we close above it on the second one, we close above it on the third one, we wick down to it but close above it on the fourth one, and then take out the top. Two days in a row, the second day we drop back out down into this range including the wick right down to the green line. Then we break the top, break the bottom, and close below both of them. But that's not enough to break them. And then we enter again in between the two and look at the wicks on the top line and then drop all the way down, you know, close to hell before coming all the way back up and then going one, two, three, four, five days in which only one of the days gets back up to the second line at the top and then drop back down below it. And we did have one day where we closed within that range of 11.1, in this case up to 11,750, back down again, back up into that area and then never return to it until now, now, it, these fields are complicated, but this action is telling me that these two fields between 10,100 in the bottom and 11,750 on the top is still alive and well. And the action that we're seeing now, I believe, is showing that. Yeah, we can get through it, but on a daily basis, after we ran all the way up to 14,000, look what happened one day later. We go all the way down through both of them. And all the way down to 10,400 from 14,000 on a daily candle. And then that's not enough. The field pops it all the way back up again. 
sucking a lot of people into thinking that it was still going somewhere. And I'm holding throughout all of this. I have not sold as of today the last 10% that we've got in Bitcoin, but I'm struggling with, and that's why I'm listening so closely to Socrates' short-term analysis, uh, because it's helping to describe to me interday what's going on with all of these things. Every one of these daily candles, except the one that formed the top, have some sort of a relationship going on with these, this field in which they break through it, get back above it, wick down into it, get back below it, get back and wick above it, but close below it. And then even this last gasp that we're working on right now wanted to touch in into that range. Okay, that's point number one. And what does that tell me about what's going on? Well, using a lot of other things, we have a daily nine here. We're on a two. Tone was very worried about a red two below a red one in our show yesterday. Well, that's just what we've gotten. And we're not closed yet. And we are struggling at the 10,500 level. But uh, we'll see how it closes in a couple of hours. But... In, in any case, if this is just a one to four, this could be over. A one to four sequential pullback off this nine. We've had one full day, two full days, screw around a little more, and then it could easily go higher. Um, but I, I believe we will find, if it does go higher from here, the same kind of action that I've shown you in this range that I, I don't see it turning around in a V bottom and going up. Now, the big risk here is this setup trend line, which is not far below the lows today. It comes at 9,500. We, we got on this candle down to 99.50. So we are not far away, 450 points basically, from taking that out. And it will take a little bit of time, which takes us through day three and maybe day four. And once you've gone to that day four, now that's about all you can expect on a one to four day pullback. And now you're getting late into the count. And late in the, to the count means you might have five more do down days. So I've got buys in for clients starting at 8,500 down to 7,500, and I'm keeping those on for now, basically equal uh, in, in how much I want to buy at each level, which gives us an average buy-in somewhere around the 8,000 level, which happens to also be where the setup trend, I'm sorry, the phase two line comes in from a long ways back. Uh, I'm worried about that now. I'm worried because of all the short-term things that Socrates has shown us over the last week that didn't work out to the upside and has begun building momentum to the downside, as well as what's going on with a, a lot of the other cryptos. Um, so the reason I'm worried is I have to make a decision, should I sell out here of our remaining positions um, because the end of an intermediate term bull market is over or should I hang on to that because of the possibility and maybe even probability because of Consensio, because of the ADX, because of what we're seeing on the monthly sequential and there has been no real damage to the longer term outlook it would be smarter to go ahead and keep these orders in and hope that we get them, but we might not get down that far. We might hold right here at this 9,400 level, 9,500 level, and that might occur tonight. It might occur tomorrow. We might buy ourselves another day or two. Then we have another setup trend line down here because we've been running all kinds of nines on this massive bull move that we've had. 
Um, and my next question is, do I want to buy in the low sixes if all this starts coming apart? Um, and I don't have answers for you. I'm just telling you what my thinking is as of um, the price action uh, right now. So I am still intermediate term bullish. It has not uh, turned around for me. I am long term bullish on Consensio. I still believe that the hyperwave uh, is intact until we go about 20,000 or hit 1,000. And I've heard some pretty good arguments why we could, if we break below this 6,000 level, start thinking in terms again of not only the low fives, but the low fours. And if we take out the low threes, then I think a lot of people are going to be surprised at how quickly we can get down to that 1,000 target. I'm not using hyperwave in any of the things I'm talking about right now. I'm just telling you that in the back of my mind, ever since we uh, bounced off 3,000, uh, that I believe that uh, hyperwave is still alive and well. And with that, unless uh, Socrates wants to add anything to these longer term charts. Oh, just uh, a couple, um, I guess, things that are definitely jumping out at me and really making me think that I might want to be selling a little bit more. Um, this is not looking too good. Um, the two things that are really jumping out at me is that the red two going below the red one, which it is following the daily close below your um, zone there, that horizontal support zone. Right. Um, we haven't uh, had a daily close below the fact that we did do that and then now have a, a red two below a red one is um, very significant to me. The other thing is the, the weekly, um, that just nasty shooting star that everybody has been looking at. Um, I always watch for the low of that candle to get taken out an entry. Um, that kind of confirms the pattern as far as I um, know it. Uh, so the shooting star in and of itself is bearish but it isn't uh, an indicator to buy or sell um, as far as i trade um, it is an indicator to sell as soon as the low of that candle gets taken out um, doesn't need to be closed below just simply needs to fall below at any point um, that that is generally a really good area to enter an order um, to go ahead and sell uh, so seeing the confirmed shooting star with the red two below the red one has really got me thinking that I, I may want to um, sell a little bit more here. And the uh, I'm seeing the same thing as you, though, in the sense that there's just so much built up support that I don't want to be selling close to um, that. Uh, we're, we're close to that TDST on the on the daily. And then the four hour um, I'm going to take over just one second. It's, it won't take me uh, very long at Great. all um just wanted to show the setup that i am seeing right now um that's jumping out at me and that is uh, this 200 ema this is a buy signal for me um so this is where i want to be buying and that's at 96 that's right very close to where the tdst level is on the daily chart um so i really don't want to be selling around the 9600 area there's a lot of support there um, so that is a very tricky sort of balance to find is um, can we uh, take some more profit here um, uh, versus um, not wanting to sell uh, when it's a buying opportunity uh, so right here um, what I think is going to happen is a retest of the um, 50 EMA that is rolling over that is what is a high probability outcome from here? Um, I'm, I'm more willing to tell you when I don't know what's coming and what I, I don't understand um, the price movements, but when I do see a, a high probability setup, I, I will um, say that as well. Um, so coming very close to the 200 EMA um, and then being on a perfect uh, red nine, 
um, is a sign to me that we should return to the 50 EMA that's rolling over. That isn't a very bold prediction. Um, it's a very small sort of target there, um, but it is, um, you know, from 10,500 to 11,100, that is significant. And if that does happen, this could just be a perfect selling opportunity um, for me uh, because I would be now selling resistance um, from horizontal, selling the rolled over um, EMA, which, that's a um, good spot to sell because I can re-enter pretty close to it if that turns out to price gets above it and flattens it and then turns it back up. Um, so this would be a very attractive selling opportunity if we can get back up to the 11,000 area. Now we're well away from the established area of support. If I can sell here, it makes me a lot more comfortable than selling close to um, this area of support. Uh, so something else just to take a look at is the um, four hour ADX is telling us to be bearish. Um, it is saying that the short term trend is bearish. Um, if you use the four hour ADX to determine your trend, um, we do have the plus, the negative DI above the plus DI with a recent cross of the ADX. Um, so this is important to me seeing um, a bearish ADX um, tells me that this confirms that this is a potential selling opportunity if we bounce to the 11,100 area. Also very interesting to me is the daily ADX has started to roll over and that's in confluence with the green nine. Um, so that's very important to me to see the ADX and the TD line up. I'm getting this rolling over after a nine while we have a red two below a red one. Further confirmation that this is a selling opportunity. Um, and if the negative DI crosses above the plus DI, that would be um, saying that the daily trend is now um, bearish as well. Uh, so th those are what I'll be keeping an eye on. Um, if we can get uh, if we can get that nice little bounce off of the 200 EMA on the four hour, it's a little a little above it. But if we can get that, and it's just trying, um, maybe right here is where I want to start looking at um, selling 10.750. Um, this is just really um, attractive um, seeing this TDST level that was very clean support, and then these rolling over on a one to four candle correction. This is a, a very attractive um, selling opportunity to me, which makes me think I, I, I may want to go ahead and sell more than I was originally planning, which to me is, is kind of like um, a short sale. Um, like I don't like shorting Bitcoin when it's in a bull market. I, I really do not like doing that. Instead, I like selling spot and trying to buy back cheaper, which is essentially a, a short in the sense that if I'm buying back more expensive, I'm, I'm costing myself capital, um, but I'm not really um, in the end of the day, I've still got the same buying power. The USD is still equivalent. Even if I have to, if I get less Bitcoin, it's still going to be worth the same USD equivalent. Um, so that in that sense, I'm able to kind of effectively short without actually having to realize any loss um, uh, because I, um, I'm realizing profit by increasing my Bitcoin holding. Um, so that, that's kind of what I'm thinking about as opposed to shorting is just selling extra. Um, and, and that being said, it is uh, more past time to wrap it up. Um, I certainly appreciate you having me on today and, and um, it's great having you back in town. Today's show was certainly much longer than um, we want to do, but Tyler has been away for a while and Bitcoin is giving us a, a lot to talk about. Um, so that was the perfect recipe for an extra long show today. Um, I, I hope everybody enjoyed it. We, we do appreciate your time and we will be trying to keep these as brief as possible moving forward but sometimes there's just uh, too much good stuff to talk about and bottom line is that that isn't really either of our strengths is, is keeping things brief so uh, thanks Tyler and uh, I'll let you say goodbye <laughs> great thank you very much Socrates as usual some great observations and uh, remember uh, July 12th and July 25th uh, we are starting to put them together right now and we'll have it all posted on the website tomorrow uh, and then we're going to have a bunch of very fun announcements uh, because lucid investment strategies is uh, growing very very quickly bringing on some new partners and we've got a bunch of great projects that we are going to begin uh, talking about so thank you all for spending uh, this time with us and back to you i won't touch any of the buttons <laughs> 
Oh, this is the time that you can do it because 